Hello and welcome. I'm Desiree Jones, and our next interview is with Dr. Venkat Narayan. Dr. Narayan is Hubert Chair of Global Health at the Rollins School of Public Health, Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia, and is one of the world's foremost diabetes researchers today. Dr. Narayan was previously Chief of the Diabetes Epidemiology Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Atlanta, Georgia. Today, he has focused his research on the preventive aspects of diabetes, obesity, and vascular diseases, and has taken a global initiative vis-a-vis -vis diabetes prevention. This interview is particularly important for those who may be diabetic or those who may be at higher risk for developing diabetes. You may want to pay close attention to a couple of very salient points Dr. Narayan makes in this interview. One, he highlights research in which aggressive lifestyle interventions enable those at higher risk for developing diabetes to reduce their risk by 50 to 60 percent, and also enable those who had some major genes for diabetes to eliminate that excess risk. This interview is about a half hour long, and while it is advisable to listen to it in its entirety, for those who may be tight on time, you may want to consider the latter half of the interview in which Dr. Narayan discusses research on lifestyle interventions. We are meeting today with Dr. Venkat Narayan. Dr. Narayan is Hubert Chair of Global Health at the Rollins School of Public Health, Emory University in Atlanta. And formerly, he was Chief of the Diabetes Epidemiology and Statistics Branch at the Division of Diabetes Translation, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Narayan's work has focused on the preventive aspects of diabetes, obesity, and vascular diseases. He has published very widely and has taken a global initiative vis-a-vis -vis diabetes prevention. And indeed, we are very honored to be visiting with him this afternoon. And Venkat, thank you and welcome. Um, I'd like to start off today's conversation with asking us, asking you, to give us a little perspective with respect to the scope and size of the diabetes problem, especially here in the U.S., um, a diabetes care paper published in 2009 indicated that by the year 2034, we're expecting diabetes to double in the United States to about 44 million. What are your thoughts uh, on that trend, uh, and do you believe that to be a very accurate estimate? I mean, essentially, uh, we've noticed that the prevalence of diabetes as a proportion of people with diabetes in the United States has been steadily going up for the last 20 years or over. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently, it's estimated there are about 24 million people with diabetes in the country, a third of whom don't know that they have diabetes. Mm -hmm. And the paper that you're referring to was an attempt to project what the future scenario might look at. And uh, we basically uh, found uh, that just taking current trends, there may be no, no additional increase in trends, just taking into account the growth of the population, the mm -hmm. aging of the population, yeah. and the diversity of the population, our projection is there will be about 50 million people with diabetes by 2050, or mm. close to that. Mm. And that's uh, a very worrying trend. And I must hasten to add that we think, if anything, those projections are conservative, mm. because we assumed that the rate of uh, new cases occurring is not going to increase any further. I see, and that is uh, probably a very, very conservative way to look at it. Um, your paper in uh, JAMA in 2003 mentioned that between 1990 and 1999, we saw diabetes rise about 40% in just less than a decade. Um, you know, when we look at these trends, and especially we see that if someone is born in 2000, uh, the paper indicated that their lifetime risk of diabetes is now one in three if you're a male, two in five if you're a female, and even higher if you're a minority in a minority mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. um, these trends seem very daunting and very disturbing. And uh, also, you know, when we compare it to, for example, the commonly known statistics with respect to breast cancer, which is one in eight for women, it seems like uh, our early alert antenna ought to be on uh, with respect to what is going on. My question to you is, what are the specific factors do you think may be accounting for these astronomical figures? I mean, essentially, I mean, th that was our first attempt right. uh, to look at lifetime risk of diabetes in the United States. Right. And we were, we were astonished, too, that, right. that the rates were so high. So essentially, like you nicely summarized it, it was one in three. But subsequently, there's been a paper in Australia hmm. uh, pretty confirming estimates very close to that for the Australian population. Okay. So I think mm -hmm. our estimates, if anything, are likely to be underestimates of the real problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why this may be happening, uh, there are probably two or three reasons. Uh, reason number one could be 
uh, that we are seeing an increase in incidence of diabetes, partly because we are recognizing diabetes better. That's true too. That could be part of the problem. Yes. But even otherwise, uh, there clearly has been an increase in obesity and overweight in the, in the US population, mm -hmm. and also in populations elsewhere. As societies industrialize, as, right. uh, as life becomes easier, as we have uh, easy availability of food, particularly refined food, mm -hmm. processed food, and also where our physical activity levels go down, either sure. leisure time or occupational physical activity levels go down, those are the risk factors for chronic diseases like diabetes. Mm -hmm. And the countries such as the United States, countries of Western Europe, countries of Australasia, mm -hmm. we're ahead of the curve in right, this, in this regard. Mm -hmm. So countries like India and China are rapidly catching up. So mm -hmm. when you see the rate at which development is happening in those countries, they are developing in 10 years what okay. it probably took 80 to 100 years over here in over, the West. over the United States right. or in Western Europe. Right. So what you're seeing really is a very rapid fast forward mm. in terms of industrialization. And plus, countries like India and China have a double challenge. They also have a huge underbelly of undernourishment, of poverty, etc. Right. So they have, they're dealing with two problems. And what's very interesting in, in India and China is that the poor people uh, seem to be increasingly at higher risk of developing diabetes. Yeah. And, the, and the epidemic is also sweeping their rural areas. Right. I mean, five years ago, people believed it was an urban phenomenon yes, or a rich true. person's phenomenon. Right. But those things are changing very rapidly. Right. It used to be, we used to think about India in terms of malnourishment or starvation, not so much in terms of obesity or overweight problems. But So you believe it's both urban and rural now? Yeah, I mean, at least in China, there was a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine a month ago basically suggesting that prevalence of diabetes in rural China is about 8.5%. Wow. And in urban China, it's a little higher than that. In India, there haven't been good data from rural India, mm -hmm. but the few studies that have been done recently also indicates that rates of diabetes in rural India may also be going up. Mm -hmm. But I should hasten to add uh, <clears throat> that in India, mal malnutrition and underweight and poverty are still problems. I mean, we can't in several areas. In several yes, areas. I yes. mean, India has a very high proportion of people who are living below the poverty line sure. and who are undernourished. So India has two major problems. Mm -hmm. there, there's a problem of obesity and overweight on the one side sure. and the problem of underweight and on the under, other side. The other side. <laughs> right. And what is very important is that when children are born underweight mm -hmm. because of maternal uh, you know, malnutrition, those children are also at higher risk of developing diabetes in the future hmm, and obesity in the future. So we have to solve both the problems together. I mean, well, that's it's a the, very, I think, a very unique uh, kind of a challenge. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yes. And uh, you know, following up on that, you have taken a pretty a massive initiative to reach out across the continents uh, to India and China and other nations. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your global initiative, especially with respect to uh, the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation and the Global Diabetes Center in Chennai. What are your long-term objectives and what is your vision uh, for this project? Uh, when we started the Global Diabetes Research Center in partnership with the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation in Chennai, mm -hmm. uh, it was basically an initiative funded by, the, by Emory's Global Health Initiative, okay. uh, Global Health Institute. And the idea was to create a hub okay. uh, in Chennai that would serve as, uh, as for research partnership between Emory and, and India okay. to start with, uh, with the potential possibility of expanding to other areas. So in Chennai, we are focusing on two specific areas. Mm -hmm. Number one, we have uh, initiated a fairly large randomized controlled trial mm -hmm. of prevention of diabetes. Okay. This is funded by the International Diabetes Federation. Okay. And uh, what we are trying to do is starting a little earlier in the natural history of diabetes mm -hmm. than other major trials have done. I see. And we want to see by also by applying a low cost lifestyle intervention can we prevent diabetes in that population? Hmm. That is one aspect of the Chennai uh, initiative. The other aspect of the Chennai initiative is the fact that there are a lot of people in India developing type 2 diabetes hmm. before the age of 25. Right, it used to be considered only adult onset. Absolutely. Right. Right. So <coughs> we would like, so we are trying to assemble a cohort of people who are developing diabetes at younger ages, mm -hmm. and we are trying to see what the causes might be by comparing them with, with similar age people who don't have diabetes at that age 
or might have pre-diabetes at that age. So we are trying to look at it from three different angles. Okay. Are there influences of maternal nutrition? Mm -hmm. Are there influences of early childhood uh, you know, uh, lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And later, you know, young, young adult lifestyles and potentially also look at the possibilities of genes contributing to all this. So, sure. so, we had li so these are the two things that we're investigating uh, in, in Chennai. Uh, I should also add that subsequently, we were funded by the NHLBI yes. and, and United Health Care Group in the United States to set up what's called a Center for Cardiometabolic Disease Prevention. Hmm. And this is headquartered in New Delhi okay. uh, with network partners in Chennai, which is our Madras Diabetes Research Foundation, Correct. and Karachi, which okay. is our, the Aga Khan University in Karachi. Hmm. So as part of that initiative, NHLBI funded initiative, there are two major studies ongoing. Okay. The first one, we are setting up cohorts of 4,000 people each mm -hmm. in each of the three cities, Delhi, Chennai, and Karachi. Okay. And the idea is to get a, a benchmark of what's the level of cardiometabolic uh, disease and, and risk factors in those right populations, mm -hmm. and also to follow them forward to in see time. at what rate, uh, rate new cases happen and what are the causes. Mm -hmm. So that's one initiative. The second one, is a randomized controlled trial in eight centers okay. uh, about uh, randomizing about 1,200 people with diabetes. Hmm. And the idea is if we can deliver all that is known about preventing diabetes complications what in a structured way, right. using a low cost approach like mm -hmm. a care coordinator, decision support system, mm -hmm. can be how much of the cardiovascular disease in that can population be can be prevented. Mm -hmm. So this one is more uh, very much a utilitarian trial. We are mm -hmm. trying to see just by applying what we already know, right. you know, how much can be prevented. Well, this is a fascinating. I think especially since this is all going to be prospective data and randomized trial data, I think these are results we, you know, should really look forward to getting. Very exciting, in fact, to, yeah. to anticipate the results. You know, talking about the randomized trials, uh, there have been, there's been one large uh, trial, the Diabetes Prevention Program, especially with Finland, Sweden, China, and the United States. And one of the things I found fascinating about that was how it showed that lifestyle factors modification uh, made a profound difference in terms of diabetes prevention for those who may be at high risk. Uh, would you like to share a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. What kind of results can people expect with aggressive lifestyle intervention? I mean, essentially, I mean, our assessment of the literature so far, based on the trials that have been done, and you mentioned the Diabetes Prevention Program right. in the United States, <clears throat> the Finnish Diabetes Prevention Program, there has been a small study in India, right. there's been a study in China. All of them point that if you identify people at high risk of developing diabetes, mm -hmm. and you're able to aggressively deliver lifestyle interventions, mm -hmm. like in the, in the DPP program in the United sure. States, it was 16 uh, weekly sessions mm -hmm. followed by eight weekly maintenance sessions okay. to help people modify their diet and modify their, uh, physical, their activity physical activity. And, so mm -hmm. and in the trials, there was between a 50 to 60% reduction okay. in the rate at which people went on to develop diabetes. That's pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable. Yes. And what's also very encouraging are two other things. Firstly, in, in the China trial, they went back uh, at, at 20 years which is about 14 years after they had stopped the intervention. Hmm. And there still was major benefit left over hmm. from the interventions. In other words, the people that were in the, in the intervention group Continued had benefits benefit. at 20 years. Hmm. And they're finding the same thing in Finland and also similar things in the United States trial, right. although in the US, the control group has also adapted changes. <laughs> yeah. So the relative difference has yes. narrowed a little bit. Right. And the other remarkable finding from the research so far is that even people with some major genes for diabetes, hmm. if they followed a lifestyle intervention, they seem to eliminate the excess risk. Wow. Like in the DPP, that has been shown for a few genes, mm -hmm. and in the Finnish study, also uh, for a few genes, that uh, if, if they had the genes and they were in the placebo group, they were at higher risk. Hmm. But if they had the genes and they were in the lifestyle group, that excess risk disappeared. Well, you know, this is a question that often comes up, you know, genes or environment, but it seems that almost uh, every subject with respect to even heart disease and cancer, as we study more closely, uh, we know that genes can predispose you to disease, but the environmental factors can, can very, uh, with some aggressive work, can actually alter the course of disease. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there was a famous saying that Jocelyn, the father, the father of diabetes, diabetes. <laughs> you know, the Jocelyn Clinic of, in Boston, once said that 
genes may load the, the, the cannon, but, they don't but fire it's, it. always, it's always the environment that <laughs> pulls the trigger. It. Yeah, that's a very good way to look so, at yeah, it. So I think yes. it's, it's both of them.